Yeah, so I always used to thought, think that the worst slot to have was immediately after lunch, but now I know it's to be immediately after, after Linda. Um, I've not been to Davos, I've not written any books. Um, yeah, no, I've not. Yeah, well, I've met, I've been in, I was in number 10. Yeah, so maybe I can tick that box. Um, and, uh, and actually, I was already planning to be slightly... Um, uh, slightly humble an audience like this because I'm very conscious that there are genuine experts in the room. Um, all I can do is, is give you a bit of an insight into um, current, current government thinking uh, uh, where, I, where I'm working. Um, and thankfully, you know, I come with the civil service stereotype of being kind of dull and uninspiring, so uh, <laughs> if, if the bar is set low. Um, so, yeah, and I'm... And I'm halfway through my 100-year life, um, so I need to also to work on how to use technology. Talk, uh, yeah. Talk, read, look, engage audience. It's all a bit complicated. Um, so, our, uh, so who am I? I'm uh, Angus Gray. I work at the Work and Health Unit, which is a joint uh, Department of Health, Social Care, and uh, Department for Work and Pensions unit, set up in uh, 2015. Um, with this, essentially, this uh, mission here, um, transforming employment prospects for disabled people and those with health conditions. Um, I mean, I've loved my 25-year career in the civil service, but, you know, it's great to do a job where you can have a fairly simple mission that it's obvious why it's worth uh, getting up uh, in the morning. Um, so I'm, yeah, very, very proud to be a part of that. And my particular responsibility, among other things, is our work uh, with employers, which is kind of why it's me uh, here today rather than somebody else from the, from the unit. Um, I think, the, the, again, I don't, I'm preaching to the converted here, I think, but you know, the case um, for action is absolutely compelling, and there are some very big numbers on that slide, both in terms of costs of ill health to the economy, in terms of the number of uh, people, uh, working days lost to sickness, um, and also this kind of the door graphic, um, I think one of the things that I, I, I've worked on welfare to work uh, policies for years, the thing that really struck me in this agenda is, is both the fact that there is, there is that welfare to work angle, people, uh, disabled people have a much higher unemployment rate and therefore there's a job to do to help people back into work, but actually this stat that they're um, twice as likely as non-disabled people to fall out of work I think is a, a critical focus for us and indeed within the wider department. Um, the thing that we are in the Working Health Unit focusing more strongly on is how do we retain uh, people um, in work um, so that, because if we're to meet our overall ambition, that needs to be part of, part of the jigsaw. Um, because the, the overall ambition that the government has set is this, the one million more disabled people in work um, in the next uh, 10 years by 2027, so moving from having 3.5 million disabled people in work to 4.5 million. Um, and that requires us to look uh, at the welfare system to make sure that we're providing uh, personalised and tailored support, joining up health and employment, to look at the health system, the role of health professionals in, in uh, giving advice to people who are um, struggling with their health condition in relation to work, and the role of the workplace, of, of you guys, of, of employers. Um, and as I said, we, we need to do both things. We need to help people into work and then try and slow down the... the fall of the rate of people falling out of, out of work. So, um, that's been made much more beautiful than I submitted it, that's lovely. Um, uh, in the, um, so on the employer agenda, our, our, what we're trying to do is to work out um, how to work with you guys to, to share best practice, to give you the information you need, to give you the support you need, uh, to kind of actively encourage um, and build on good behavior that already exists. Because many leading employers, probably everyone in this room maybe, already know uh, uh, the importance of this agenda. And actually, one of that's been one of the great things when I've, when I've done talks like this about, um, it, I think maybe 10 years ago, it might have felt I was pushing a, a boulder up a hill, but actually everyone is, is particularly seized of, of this agenda at the moment. I think the growth of awareness of mental health in particular has helped there. But also, uh, right now, in a tightening labour market with, um, with Brexit 
uh, looming, um, which is bound to, bound to affect the economy in all sorts of known and unknown ways. Um, and uh, with the 100-year the, the life, the potential of working to 80 to save us all, um, but with later retirement, I mean, people, as they get older, will develop more health conditions while they're in work, and so the, the uh, supporting them while they're in work becomes more and uh, more important. Um, and so there are some great examples uh, already, but we also know that um, uh, other employers need, need some uh, support to, to get on board and to do the right thing. So these are some of the things we've been uh, focusing on in the unit. Uh, first of all, kind of trying to get our own house in order, making sure that the civil service can claim to be a leading employer and then uh, supporting wider uh, public sector leadership. We've got a public sector summit coming up uh, in a couple of weeks uh, where we'll gather other bits of the public sector and, and share good practice and, and a bit of ministerial exhortation to do better. We're then making sure that the, uh, the existing advice and support uh, that is available for employers can be uh, built on improved. I hope some of you have heard of both access to work, which helps with the, the costs of, of adjustments, and um, the, the disability confidence scheme, uh, where employers can make commitments to, um, uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to this agenda, basically. We're thinking about what information we can bring better together as a big uh, response to our consultation, which said that actually um, it's not that we don't want to do the right thing. There's a kind of there's an element of fear and uh, ignorance about what, what that might look like. Um, but we're also conscious that you know, another government website is almost certainly not the answer. So we're thinking about both content. We're doing some work on uh, what might the top 10 reasonable adjustments be and how can we easily explain those to employers who are worried about the, that they might be high cost and so on. But also doing some experimentation uh, in Cornwall about peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, uh, conversations. Because employers say we're much more likely to listen uh, to uh, our colleagues and our peers who've, who've gone through similar things and can talk our language than we are to listen to, to you, Angus. Um, so we're trying to work out how we can enable those conversations to work, to work better, particularly with, uh, uh, with SMEs who are, who are in, uh, always hard for us to um, reach. And then we're also doing some work on transparency. I had a, a working group yesterday with a small number of employers trying to look at what that might look like, the, the notion here being that if we can get better uh, report it, or better collection of data, uh, better storytelling in organizations, first of all internally about what you're doing, uh, how many disabled people you employ and so, much and so on, what, what you do for, to support well-being, what you do to support mental health, and then move into uh, external reporting that that might become um, a, a real powerful uh, uh, tool and, and lever for change, very much uh, starting um, uh, on, on it being entirely voluntary and indeed trying to design a framework that's flexible, recognizing that uh, employers start in all sorts of different places and some things are easier for some than uh, others. Um, and then this is probably the biggest area of work at the, at the moment, um, which is us trying to take a step back and uh, do some proper kind of economic analysis and policy making around incentives and, and expectations for employers. Um, so uh, here the issue is we recognize that actually the business case may not really exist for some people to, do, to, to invest in this agenda, that there are existing uh, legal requirements, there are existing um, financial incentives of one kind or another, um, and we want to kind of review everything that's in place and uh, start to think, well, what might a better, more coherent um, framework look like? And so we're looking in particular at uh, statutory sick pay, and how that might be uh, reformed is very striking that our system is really very different to, um, to international, uh, what, what other countries do. Um, and Matthew Taylor's uh, Good Work report um, made a number of other recommendations about ways it could be adjusted, so we're looking at those too. Um, we're thinking about uh, both the statutory sick pay itself present uh, financial incentives, uh, uh, ways that we could play with financial incentives, but also looking more broadly at financial incentives and, and whether there are any that have an evidence base that could convince Treasury to, to bite. Um, and then in particular looking at occupational health where um, so many employees ha don't have access, but it is potent a good occupational health advice can be a real powerful tool for, for the individual and the, the manager to get the right support in place and to get kind of rapid and effective return to work from sickness in particular. Um, so we, we are 
I think we committed in our publication last year to, to kind of bring this work to a conclusion towards the end of, end of the year, so that's um, still what we're working towards. Um, so a little bit, I've already mentioned a little bit about the Stevenson Farmer review. Um, I, I hope uh, many of you have read it. I think it, uh, I mean, it was an independent review done for us. Um, and they, they spoke to a lot of people. They got some help with some of the economic and uh, financial analysis. And I think uh, what they've come out with is a, a short, fairly, e well, very easy to read, compelling uh, uh, statement of, of uh, mental health in the, in the workplace, and some, um, some fairly simple recommendations, I think. So the first of all, in the business case, of it, similarly to that overall picture of um, disabled people falling out of work, actually, uh, you're um, twice as likely to, to uh, fall out of work if you have a mental health condition, um, which amounts to 300,000 people leaving work every year. I'm told that's the population of Newcastle or Belfast. Um, it's normally yeah, the size of Wales, isn't it? But this is, yeah. <laughs> um, the, and then the costs again, I mean, um, some um, uh, creative work by um, partners here to, to kind of pile as bigger. I, I mean, I think, I, I think any number that has billion on the end is a big number, but if you can get it up to 30 to 40 billion, you're, you're clearly in huge territory. Um, and you know, you're all here today because you, you get the, the well-being story. And the, the standards, I think, are, um, you know, at one level, there was a bit of, I think, maybe I shouldn't say that out loud, a little bit of eye-rolling in the office about, is it really that simple? But actually, sometimes it's the simple things that are, are, are most powerful. So actually, they've come up with some core standards which they're saying all employers should be able to do this stuff. I mean, not, some of this really, it's easy to write down or easy to read, but obviously some of it, getting it absolutely right is not straightforward, and I would particularly draw out the kind of, uh, what is it, fourth and fifth uh, bullets there. So um, there are days that my job feels fulfilling, and I feel like I have control and purpose, but there are days when I feel out of control um, <laughs> and uh, highly stressed and, and so on. Um, that's the same for, for all sorts of people and others clearly are in, in industries where actually uh, genuinely feeling like it's fulfilling until the robot takes it away from you is, is difficult. Um, and that people management thing is obviously so key, you know, HR professionals in the, in the room, but actually I was really struck recently of going to, to a local service in Sheffield where I live and listening to the stories of, of actually quite often public sector employers who have fantastic policies and awful implementation. Um, so uh, individual line managers just doing rather daft things and claiming there's no flexibility and not, and not remembering common sense uh, should apply. Um, so actually really equipping your, your frontline managers to be confident and capable is, is key. And then there are some enhanced standards that they're aiming at, uh, at larger employers particularly, as you can see, kind of focusing on, on transparency um, as being key. So I'll just uh, leave you with um, just some thoughts about what you might do with some of this uh, information and indeed other inspiring stuff you're going to get uh, today. So um, do those mental health standards in Thriving at Work make sense to you? Could you visibly be doing something about them in your organization, kind of commit to implementing them or, or remind your organization that actually you already uh, meet them? Um, are there other kind of uh, best practices that you can be working on, particularly around, we've heard already about the power of, the, of board uh, leadership um, and accountability. Is there more you can do about transparency, getting stories, to both yeah, data, but I always like, I like stories too. We've, we've got, I'm sure many of you have as well, we've got a movement inside our own department at the moment about, um, I, I can be me at work telling stories about people who've, um, who've had mental health issues and dealt with them and being open and honest about it, which just completely shifts the, uh, the culture in the organization, thinking about what extra support your line managers might need, and then you know, thinking about both the existing support, like the disability confidence scheme and, and the peer-to-peer -peer stuff that that can give you, the access to work, help for individuals, but also what, what networks can you draw on kind of in the room today? What, what, if you, you feel yourself as a leader already, then what could you be doing to support organizations you work with, colleagues that you're uh, in networks with, and so on to really promote and advance this agenda?
Thank you.